Okay, there there we go. So now we have Hurl and Raleigh on a phone on the phone, and let me see if I can hear him. Can you hear me? Uh... Yes, I hear, I hear you. I hear you wonderfully, Cliff. You can. Okay, great. Um, I'm just going to turn you up a little bit. Can you talk again? Right. Can everybody? Yes, hello. There you are. Okay. Hello. Can you all hear? Okay. So we've had some connectivity, some connectivity issues. Sorry about that. Um, we're going to start now. I have, I have Mr. Herlin Riley on the phone, and I'm going to repeat what I said. Um, my name is Clifford Kaufman. I'm in Nashville, Tennessee. I'm a percussionist, educator, and uh, uh, anyway, I'm honored to have Mr. Herlin Riley on the show Cliff Chats. We do this every Friday. Um, and uh, Mr. Riley first started um, playing, well, was, is, is from the Lasty family and uh, was around music as a baby, but I believe started playing Pops and Pans. And then you uh, started playing drums at three, started studying piano at 10, trumpet at 12, and then started learning music fundamentals and theories from Yvonne Bush around 15 years of age. Is that all correct? Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Um, uh, I never... Piano. Um, I, I learned. Yeah, I, I started learning uh, from the piano. I started playing the trumpet around twelve, uh -huh. around in the sixth grade, and um, then I started. You know, that was my main instrument. I, I wasn't really interested in playing the drums, although I could play the drums as a kid growing up. And um, just as time, as time went on, there was always a piano around the house, so I kind of just started dibbling, dabbling in, in the piano. And when I got to high school. I started learning a little theory and that kind of thing and started applying it to the piano. So I never really had a piano lesson. Okay. But um, um, I did take trumpet lessons. I never had a drum lesson. Um, Interesting. So, so you said you took piano, I mean, you took you took trumpet lessons, but that was the only instrument that you studied, like formally from it, a teacher. Exactly. Exactly. It's the only instrument I studied was the trumpet. Okay. And uh, the trumpet is such a mean instrument, man. If you, you know, it chops, man. If you don't have, if you don't have good, a good embouchure, and actually a good teacher to, to teach you how to how to breathe and and blow correctly into the horn, it's so challenging, man. So um, it was just extra challenging for me, and so I decided to put it down. And you know, the drums were so much more comfortable, and so much I was, I felt so much at home playing the drums. So that's how I made, the, I really made the switch when I was about 18 years old. I, I was doing gigs in in New Orleans, doing both trumpet and and um and drums and uh, just so happened that I, I started getting more calls for, for the drums and less calls for the trumpet. Okay, so it just it just kind of it kind of naturally worked itself out. So I, I just wanted to tell you I, I um I, I mentioned to you before when we talked I'm I'm a huge fan. I uh, uh when I was in college my brother lived in New Orleans and I um around ninety six or ninety seven went to the Jazz and Heritage Festival and um, was hanging out in the jazz tent and kept working my way up closer as you know between bands and ended up in about the fourth or fifth row um when you you went on with uh Wynton marsalis i think as a septet i don't remember how many people were, it was exactly but um but i'd never experienced anything like that before um you know where where it was um it looked like you all were practicing um some sort of uh you were like levitating and you were, uh, you were, you were, you know, reading each other's minds and practicing some, you know, I just never seen anything like that. The, the musical connection and the precision and everything. And, and it really, uh, it really did change my, my life and, and what I wanted, what I wanted to get out of, you know, out of life musically and that sort of thing. So anyway, I just, just want to say that I really, um, really appreciate what you do and, uh, and um, I'm very, very happy to be able to have a conversation with you. For people who are just tuning in, um, Mr. Riley was not able to connect video-wise, so we have him on the phone here. Um, and hopefully you can hear. Um, Bob, you said you could barely hear. Hopefully you can hear now. I, I turned everything off. Oh. Uh, hopefully you can hear me too. What's that? I said hopefully you can hear me as well. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Um, let me just check the mixer. Looks like, can everybody hear Mr. Riley okay? Testing one two one two one two. Testing everybody. Yeah, that sounds. I think it's good. Te do one more one more test, please. Test one two one two one two. Okay. Hello world. There we Hello, go. Hello world. There we go. <laughs> I think I think it works. Um, so so, I just I just you know just wanted to have an improvised conversation just about you know you, you're somebody who I f I feel like music just seeps out of you it just it's it's as natural as walking or talking and um 
you know, I'm wondering what, were there certain things where you had to really, I mean, I'm sure you had to work really hard, I mean, to, to play, to be at the level you're at, but I'm just curious, like, what are some of the things that you, uh, you really had to hone in on? Well, first of all, I was very fortunate to uh, have, have been raised by, by musicians. My uncles were all musicians, the last three brothers. One was a trumpet player, one played saxophone, and one played drums. And um, and they were rehearsed in my grandmother's house, even from the time I was a uh, infant child. They would have rehearsals, and so I would go into the, they would actually roll my crib into the room, and that would kind of calm me down. That, the music was my pacify <laughs> during that. And um, so I got to hear the music firsthand, um, so I didn't have to go back and try to understand what swing was or what a groove was. And I, I, I was really, really hearing the music. Um, like the the language that it is, yeah, and you know, and the the way that we learn the language is, is somebody speaks to us, we 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 internalize it and then we regurgitate it, we we speak it back, mm-hmm. and so the the music worked for me the same way. I was hearing the music as a child, um, and then I got to experience it um, playing music in the church when I was a young boy. My grandfather played the drums in the church, and um, incidentally, he he was. He was as a as a boy himself. He actually played with Louis Armstrong in 1913 in the Waste Home. Wow! So, so he played the drums and he played the drums in church. Where, where did so you say he played with Louis Armstrong? In 1913. Uh-huh. 1913. He was but, in the Waste Home. The what? Home? He was in the Waste Home where where Louis Armstrong began to play the trumpet. Oh, uh, okay. Mr. Peter Davis. Yeah, way back then, and um, my grandfather, had, you know, he he you know got himself into trouble. And they put him away in the home, okay. in the Waves home. And so he, he, he played the drums while he was there. And uh, he told me these stories. And then um, as, as a boy growing up, I went to church with him a lot. There yeah. was a, you know, I went, to, I went to the spiritual church with him a lot in the, here in New Orleans. And, and he played the drums in the church. And so um, in doing so, I, I always sit next to him. And I couldn't wait till he got up to speak or to do something, and I got a chance to play the drums. So, in my in my early childhood, I did get a chance to actually play the drums and and to play them in a in a way that that was you know in a church service. And in doing so, um, I would I would try to play the drums in the church. And my grandfather would 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 actually um, I would try to play little little hip beats that I was hearing. That was coming up, like James Brown, something, or you know, or, or the group from Rachel's "What I Say" or something like that. I, I was trying to find out, find out little hip, hip grooves to play, and my grandfather would always say, "Uh, uh-uh, don't play that in here. That's that's not the place for this. Mm-hmm. You just play play the beat straight, just like I'm playing it." So he would, you know, and so from that, I really got to understand the power of repetition and the power of rhythm, and how how when you when you play a groove. You know, it really, really um, it permeates a certain kind of spirit that's inside of you. Hearing that repetition and hearing that groove, it makes you want to move, yeah. makes you want to dance, makes you want to, you know, do something. And so, that's something that that that, that I learned as a kid, as a boy growing up, um, the power of of a groove and, rep, and the repetition of a groove and how how to how to really, really um, set the foundation for the music. Mm-hmm. If you listen to if you listen to music right now, you know a lot of rap music. You know people are not attracted to the words all the time. They're attracted to the foundation of the groove, yeah, and, and the rhythm and the rhythm that that the rappers are speaking with. So the rhythm, the rhythm is um, all music starts with rhythm, and so the music, the rhythm is such an important part of the music. So um, oftentimes, it's you know, is is overlooked. But when you really dissect the music, it's really, really the rhythm that, that that's really, really attracting um, to to you know in, in most cases. So um, so that was my foundation, and and I learned early on that um, I didn't and that I didn't get that from reading music or or, or necessarily. Li- I listened to some records and I listened to some things on on records, but. Most of most of my 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 knowledge came from my engagement uh-huh. to the music, you know, and um, so music is not you know it's not on the paper, you know, it's it's in you. Yeah. And and you have to be you have to be surrounded with people that you play with, 
that actually can can pull it out of you that you that you respect and that you have a, have a rapport with that you can listen to them and they and they can ha- you can have a conversation you can have a dialogue with the people that you're playing with that they they can speak to you from what they're playing from their experiences and you also speak to them through your experiences and you come together and and form a bond to, to create something that's beautiful mm-hmm. so um so that's and and when you talked about Winston and, and that that experience that you saw that you saw us in yeah. um at the Jewish Festival, you know that was a, you know that was a great compliment. You said that we seemed like we were levitating, <laughs> yeah. but you know <laughs> that's you know that's, it's a really it's a big exaggeration, but you know I'll take it. <laughs> but the but the fact is the fact is you know we we actually we rehearsed and we. We we practiced and we 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 were able to to put some things together as far as the the form of the music, understanding the piece that we were, the pieces that we played. But besides that, it was all about improvisation, and we we all we we, we often had conversations about um, how we can play how we can play the music and make it better. And we would actually you know we spent a lot of time on the road together, and sometimes we. Would, you know, we had cassette tapes, and we would we would rehearse. rehearse. I mean, we we actually, we were, I'm sorry, we would, we would record the shows that we would play the night before, mm-hmm. and you know, in traveling to the next city or something, we would actually listen to the music back, and then we would we would dissect it, and we would say, "Hey, man, seeing that moment right there, you know, we could have made another choice. We could have did something else. We could have did this. We could have did that." And uh, we would actually listen to the music, and and would just. Also, not only comp- not only um, dissecting the music in a way that we were looking for mistakes or looking for other options, we would also look at the good the good sides, mm-hmm. you know, the good choices that we made, you know, the good choices that we made in the music, and it was all about having a dialogue and communication with each other. Yeah, and I think that's that that was the whole that was the key um, to 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 playing with him and playing with him. And also, another thing that we did, we didn't. We didn't use monitors in a lot of a lot of instances. In the beginning, you know, Winston started saying, "Man, let's let's try not to play with the monitors, so that we can play in balance." So and and in play balance with each other without monitors, one of the key factors was to listen to the bass, because the bass, an acoustic bass, um, was like the softest instrument in the band, but uh, it was the, the most essential as far as the the the, the the grounding of the rhythm section. So, and so we would, we, we would have a theory, if you can't hear the bass, you're playing too loud. Yeah, was that a challenge for you at first? Of course that was a challenge, you know, because as a drummer, you know, a drummer is, you know, you're, you're so much, um, there's so much power in the drums. Mm-hmm. You know, the drums, the drums, the, dr- the drum is, it can be like a, um, for lack of analogy, if, you, if you're an acoustic set, in, in, in an acoustic setting, the drummer can be like a football player that walks into a nursery school and just can just <laughs> overpower everybody. Yeah. So you can either do that, overpower everybody, or you can embrace everybody. And so, depending on how you're playing, and how you how you you know how, how, your sensitivity and your creativity, you you can really really embrace all you know. Other people can you can embrace every and embrace everybody mm-hmm. and have the music. Do something that's really, really profound and beautiful, or you can be bombastic and play over over everybody and make something ugly. Yeah. So there's a lot of power in the drums, and um, so just being being sensitive to who you're playing with and the instruments that you're playing really will, will make a difference in in your performances. Yeah. Yeah. So so was there what did you know through your development? Was there a period where you you had specific things where you you felt like I need to really hone in on this and work on this, or was it pretty more natural? I mean, because because you're playing so natural, and you know, I, I, to me, you learn music in the ideal way, where where you learned it just through experience as as a language. Whereas a lot you know, a lot of us didn't grow up with the sort of um, mm-hmm. environment that you grew up with that you know that's so musical. Um, so what were there areas or is it is it just something that's just is it like like walking and talking for you no well there there is of course there's there's things that you have to have to learn in order to grow you have to be always searching um for for ideas and searching for 
for development. You can't, you know, music is a, is a, um, you know, it's, it's a work in progress and you never arrive. So there's always things to learn. There's always things that you can, you know, always think there's always something to learn. Yeah. And so there were times in my life where I would, I would focus on certain aspects of my playing. You know, I was fo- focused on the ride symbol sometimes. Mm-hmm. I would focus my comping, the dialogue between the, the snare drum and the bass. Um, I would focus on sometimes, on, if I was playing a groove, what what is it that makes this particular groove, what, what, give, what, what, what gives this, this particular groove its identity? Mm-hmm. And I would focus on things like that. So there's always stuff to, to, um, to focus on. And and the, the more you focus on different aspects, the more you, the more growth that you have. Yeah. So yes, you know it's it's all it's not all most of it is natural, but still in, in being natural, you still have to work at some things. Yeah. Was there were there ever technical things that you worked on? Of course, you know, um, learning to play. As I said, I never studied the drums, mm-hmm. so I would actually practice um, and try. I would practice on the bed practice on my bed or practice with a pillow to so that I wouldn't have any rebound and to learn how to to, to strengthen my wrists mm-hmm. um, to strengthen my re- reflexes and those kinds of things so from from a, from a technical perspective those are the kinds of things I practice and not not really um, having a teacher or, or studying the drums in a formal kind of way I knew that you know t- from in my eyes there's only three strokes to playing the drums it's a single stroke, it's a double stroke, and it's like a buzz uh-huh. what you, what you do with the buzz roll uh, or a press roll. So everything else is a combination of that. Yeah. A five, you know, a five stroke roll is a combination of, of, of single two doubles and you know, uh, and two sets of doubles. Or, or a seven stroke roll or a flam is two is two single strokes that's played back to back. So uh, everything to me is a common is is it's only the three strokes single double in the, in the buzz and so everything is a com- everything else is a combination so um i would actually challenge myself when i would be practicing to um to 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 make these um i would make up rhythms i would make up like parody i would, well i would make up like rudiments for my oh. own personal self to, to kind of challenge myself to 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 uh to have command and control of the drumsticks uh-huh yeah when you're learning a new piece of music, how do you approach learning, and has that changed over the years? Well, I try to listen to the whole form of the music, and um, and internalize it. Of course, sometimes there are some pieces that you have to read, and you have to, um, there, you know, when to start writing long form pieces, where it wouldn't be like a a b a section or you know like that. Uh, yeah, it would be long, where the music would just take into different shapes and go into different areas. So. I would actually read the music, but in reading the music, um, while I was reading, I was actually trying to listen to what was going on around me and to 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 to, to really really internalize the music so that I, I would know how to to shape the music as from a drummer's perspective. Yeah. Um, you know, the music is not on the paper. The, the paper is only the guide. The music is in you. So, figure that you can get away from the paper. The more that you can be, the more expressive you can be, and the more um, life that you can bring to the music. So, um, reading music is 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 the guide, and the quicker you get, as I said, the quicker you get away from it, um, and and start to hear and listen to the listen to the musicians, the better it is. Yeah. You know, um, you know, as a musician, the music is is. It's a lot different just hearing the music or listening to the music. And it's always a challenge to listen while you're playing because you're playing and creating. While you're creating, you're still trying to listen. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, sometimes you can fall off into a, a, um, a lethargic kind of sense and just hear the music while it's passing by, but you're not really listening. So the, the challenge is always to listen to listen while you're playing. And when you're listening, then that means that you can engage. You can engage in a in a in a proper way, as opposed to just hearing. And you just the music is just you're just glazing over the music, where you just kind of not really really involved or in tune with it. You're glazing over it. Yeah, that's hearing them. 
But when you're listening to the music, it, you're internalizing it, and it, you're, you're, te- you're internalizing it, and you're getting in. You're trying to get inside of it to to understand how to fit your part inside the other people's part. Uh huh. Yeah. So, so do you think your your time with a trumpet that set you up to be able to to read the music and get in the music through reading, or as as reading, I guess, as you were reading? Yes. Well, yes. My time with the trumpet really gave me the entree to 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 learning to read. It gave me. Um, it, also, it also helped me with understanding form and melodies mm-hmm. and uh, and harmonies. So, so I hear the music from all those different perspectives. You know, from a rhythmic perspective, from a melodic perspective, perspective, and from a harm, harmonic perspective, whereby you can hear the shapes of the music as it. You know, uh, uh, the shapes of the harmony and how it's how it's moving. Yeah. So when, whenever, you know, whenever anybody writes music for me, and I'm, you know, I always request that they put the changes in the music. Uh-huh. So that I'm not just reading, I don't want to just read lines and stripes and be counting, just counting bars. Yeah. I don't like, I don't like doing that. I like, I like to be able to see the, 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 um, the structure. Yeah. And you can, you can see the structure when they, when they put in the, um, the chord signatures. I mean, yeah, the card signatures, you, you see it. Yeah, have you, see, have you ever um, been given a natural number system chart? Because they're, they're like that with the chords. I'm sorry, what was the question again? When recording, have you ever um, been presented with natural number system charts? Natural number charts. Natural numbers. Na- I don't Nash- what you... Nashville number? There's a natural number system, which is like a way of charting songs. I just wonder if you'd ever come across that. Oh, you mean like like you know like the, the, to play the one or to play the five? Yeah, or... yeah. No, 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 no. I don't mean that. Uh-huh. I mean, I mean, show me a G sharp or, or F F minor or, or you know. So you want to see the actual C. chord, the chords in the yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah, got because it. you you know you kind of understand like if you see a, if you see a diminished chord, you know that that has a specific kind of sound, you yeah. know, and so. So you kind of understand how, how how the music is really being shaped through the through the through the through the chords, mm-hmm. you know. Um, music, you know, it's, 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 if you just if you just did it from a, a, a perspective of intervals, that doesn't really do it for me, you know. To say the the one and then you go to the five and then the four. If yeah. you're playing a blues or, or some simple music like that, you know, well, I shouldn't say simple music. But if you're saying playing music that's less complex, mm-hmm. you can, uh, you know, the, the number system may work. But when, it, when 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 the music has a lot of different, if it's not just blues based or, or some kind of form, or, a 32 bar form like a, like a, um, you know, rhythm changes form or something like that, you know, you want to see the chords that you can, you know, um, be able to understand how the music is being shaped. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, the Majesty of the Blues, what was that session like? And is it true, uh, I heard a story, and y- y- I'm pretty sure you would know if it's true, that you all opened up for Miles Davis and that that was kind of a big event. And I'm just I'm just curious about your perspectives on those, that that's recording yes. in that. Yes, we did open up for Miles Davis. We, we, did, we, did, we did a few gigs where we opened for Miles. Uh-huh. And, uh, and Winston was... Um, uh, during that time, he was trying to. Well, well, I followed first. First of all, I followed Jeff Tain Watts yeah. in the band, and Jeff Tain, And so the, the the sound that he created, the the music, the the uh, the, the, the identity of of Winston's band was um had its own identity. Where it was a different identity with Jeff Tain Watts than it was when I got into the band. Uh-huh. So so Tain played basically played a lot of swing and a lot of um uh. Um, interactive kind of playing. They were they were more interactive. Uh-huh. Were, were you know were in conversational with each other, um, and the, the drums were such a um, such a strong part of that that conversation because it was more as opposed to being a, a rhythmic bass. Uh, it was more of a, of a, a so, it was rhythmic bass, but it was also interactive interactive as a soloist. Yeah. So he would actually play play solos while while keeping the rhythm, but 
but the solo would be interactive with the horns. So that was a whole different kind of concept that that was developed um, with Tame. Uh-huh. When I got into the band, when I got into the band, the music became more rhythmic based. Uh, I should say foundational rhythm. Uh-huh. It, foundational would, that, would that mean rhythm. groove? Groove. Yeah. Yes. Yes. It became more more groove oriented, and um, and so even though we, we, we there would be times where we'd actually go into that that other style of playing with, with interactive solo is you know where the drums are kind of playing solo. Solos and interacting with the with the um, with the horns, whoever was playing a solo, mm-hmm. we did a lot of that as well. But the music really did go into more of a groove kind of um, uh, setting, and, and in doing so, yes, we did we did the Magic of the, the Magic of the Blues is one of the first tunes that we recorded with that kind of vibe on it. Mm-hmm. And that session, that particular session, he had the, that was the Magic of the Blues, and he had the over on the third day and the Death of Jazz. And um, that was, you know, it was, it was this long sermon that he put in there uh, in the music, and it said, you know, that, you know, they were talking about the death of jazz, and he, and part of the story, the, I guess, the gist of the story was, be careful of premature autopsy. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, and so meant, meant meaning that, you know, for a long time, critics were were saying that jazz is dead, jazz is dead, mm-hmm. and uh, that was thirty years ago. And we're still playing jazz even today. And, and even 30 or 40, 50 years before that, they were saying that jazz was dead. Mm-hmm. So, you know, so he wrote that piece um, to say, you know, jazz is still alive and it's a living, breathing art form. And it will be with us for as long as people are, are playing instruments and want to be expressive and express themselves through their instrument. Yeah. And will continue to evolve. Yes, Exactly. And so what was the so, vibe of that session? Well, the vibe of the session was, um, I mean, it, it, was, it was a great vibe um, to the session. And, and, you know, during that, on that particular session, we had some New Orleans musicians that, that he had incorporated um, on, on that particular session and who, who are no longer here. Mm-hmm. One of the guys um, was a trumpet player by the name of Teddy Riley. Mm-hmm. He was an additional trumpet player. He was from here, here in New Orleans, uh-huh. and um, um, it was another guy from here in New Orleans. His name was Freddie Lonzo. He played the trombone. He's still alive. Uh-huh. And, and um, he had also he had one of my mentors, Danny Barker. Uh-huh. Is he a ban- was he Danny is he a banjo player? Yeah. Da- yes, Danny Barker played the banjo. He played guitar, and. Uh, he actually was, you know, he played with Billy Holiday, he played with Cap Calloway, he played with um, Milt Hinton, and he played with Dizzy Gillespie. He played with a lot of different people. Wow. Because he, he lived in New York, and he went to New York in 1930, uh-huh. Danny Barker. And then um, he but came some, back to from New Orleans. Or no? he came, yes, he came back to New Orleans in the 70s. Uh-huh. And he, he formed a band of all kids, and it was called the Fairview, March, Fairview Baptist Church. Um, marching band, a uh-huh. Christian band, uh-huh. and we all and I was a part of that band, and so was Winton and uh, Dr. Michael White, who plays the clarinet. And um, okay, yeah. So a, a lot of us, you know, who, who were musicians at the time, we were kids. We were kids playing in, in that band. So when Winton got ready to do the um, Magic of the Blues session, he actually called Danny Barker to come up and to play on that session with us. Uh-huh. It was a wonderful session for us, and in, in that that you know we, we got to record with one of our peers. I mean, not not peers, one of our mentors. Yeah. Uh, and um, you know, and so and we had we had conversations where we where he told stories, and you know, and this the whole, you know the camaraderie of the musicians, you know, is always you know, you have you know when you have a good camaraderie off the bandstand, oftentimes you will have a good you you would develop good music on the bandstand. Uh huh. How often do you find, and I, I still want to hear more about the Majesty of Blues and opening up for Miles, but how often do you find where, where do you ever find that if you don't have that com- com- camaraderie or connection that, that the music, that you still have that musical connection? Well, sometimes you run into musicians who are, who are on, you know, the level, of, the level of their musicianship is sometimes support. And, and yeah. it, you know, 
that that doesn't happen for me very much anymore because you know I kind of question who, well who's who's on the gig who's playing uh-huh. and what so but sometimes I do run I do run into situations where where the, the musicians are subpar uh-huh. and although you you want to be open open minded and um, receptive to people and but everybody has different abilities and everybody has a different voice yeah and sometimes sometimes. Um, things just just doesn't line up, mm-hmm. you know, and that's, that's nobody. That's not necessarily anybody's fault. It just doesn't line up, and the vi- so it makes for bad vibration on the bandstand. Or sometimes you may have musicians who have who, have, who, who, who actually are proficient on the instrument who can play, but they have a bad attitude. Yeah. So, and, and when you find find people who have a bad attitude who who are full of their own ego and want to stroke their own ego all the time and. and, and so that 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 leads to a, a position whereby, you know, they don't, nobody can hear what you have to. Their ears are not open enough to hear what you have to say. It's about all about what they're playing. Yeah. And and so when you find situations like that, then that makes for a bad attitude. Makes makes for the music doesn't really the music suffers. Yeah. But when when you when you when you have one of the things that I I tell my students is that. Be, really be great with the music. You have to have confidence and humility, uh-huh. and they have to balance. They have to balance. You have to have, you know, the, the confidence allows you to get on the stage and do what you do. Humility allows you to, to to be able to hear other people and to receive information. Yeah. So when you find a situation where 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 musicians are, are, are particular players are so full of their own ego, oftentimes the music will will lack something. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. Yeah. So, so the majesty of the blues. So, so, um, and then what was that experience like opening up for Miles? Well, you know, um, it was actually it was great. You know, Miles Davis was you know was a, was a, was a great great musician, and um, he he was an icon. He was an iconic musician. He was an icon. Yeah. And uh, you know, during the time that you know we we, we were opening for Miles. You know, a lot of Miles, well, Miles had kind of gotten away from the whole swing groove, the whole the whole groove of swing. He, most of, most of his things were were um, yeah, Ricky Wellman playing the drums with him. Who was? And Ricky Wellman. Okay. And uh, Ricky Wellman is one of these drummers. He came from D.C. and uh, and so he was he was really really steeped in the go go. Oh yeah. Go go groove. And so. A lot, of, a lot of the music came, you know, had, had that kind of go, the go go pocket, you know, had a lot of that in it. And so, um, during that time, that particular time, this is this is the late nineties. Yeah, I think this. No, 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 no. This is the early nineties. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Late eighties, early nineties. And so, um, Winter was really, really strong about um, about the groove of swing. Yeah. Because all all of the music was was going into a backbeat and um so miles miles's music his shows were kind of you know kind of backbeat and they were doing um uh what was the tune that that uh um the bass player wrote two two uh-huh two two uh you know, marcus, doing, uh, I'm... marcus miller yes marcus miller. yeah uh, they were doing two two and they were doing tunes like that and so um, Winston was, you know, he heard it, but he's saying like, man, you know, we're not going into that direction. We, 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 we're going straight ahead. We're going, we're going to stay with the straight ahead kind of thing. Uh-huh. And, and so that's what we, we were basically playing music that was straight ahead. Although, um, we would play grooves, but he would always tell me, develop a groove, but don't put the backbeat in it. Mm-hmm. So I would, I would, I would hook up different kinds of grooves and stuff. With the cowbell, or with some, you know, or we're playing the tambourine, or the washboard, or something. Yeah, I really and, hear that in your playing, for sure. Yeah, and so I would kind of purposely stay away from playing a backbeat on two and four. Yeah. So that was a con- that was like a contrast. That was a contrast between, you know, Winston Septet at the time and and what Miles was doing. Uh huh. And and so are the stories true about Miles's reaction to to you all? Or I'm not sure what those stories are. Okay, I just heard that. Well, you know, 
it's been a long time since I've heard that story, but but that it, that it, that it was. What, I mean, like, what what did you all interact with Miles much? Not very much. Miles Winton did. Winton did. Winton, you know, Winton Winton interacted with Miles. Uh-huh. But, uh huh. But he would he would really, um, you know, he would go in, like go into his dressing room, and we we would I hardly saw him. I didn't even, I really didn't see Miles very uh-huh. much. I saw him, you know, maybe on stage, and other than that, you know, he stayed, he, you know, he stayed to himself. Uh-huh. But Winston, would, Winston would actually go into his dressing room and, and have conversations with him, or you know, Winston, Winston. One time, Winston just went on stage and started playing with him. Uh huh. You know, not invited. And huh? Was he invited or no? I think one time he was was not invited. Uh huh. He just he just went on stage and was playing, man. So. Winston was kind of radical in his early days. Uh huh. So, uh, yeah, he just went on stage and started playing, and, you know, and Miles, get off the stage, get off the stage. Uh huh. But, um, yeah, so, um, he was really, um, he was, he was kind of, uh, aloof, uh, to, he was, he wasn't really, he, he, Miles didn't really come and engage with us. Uh huh. You know, unlike, unlike other musicians, like John Lewis, John Lewis actually who played with the Modern Jazz Quartet. Yeah. The, the, John Lewis, we actually worked with John Lewis. He came up and he and he, he kind of sat and played. Dizzy came around and Dizzy Dizzy kind of you know would, would interact with us. Oh, nice. Are there recordings? Are there recordings with them? With them? No, no, there's no recordings of that. Uh huh. But El- Elvin Jones, Elvin Jones, man, Elvin Jones was a great. I mean, I I had a, I, I I learned a lot from Elvin Jones. Uh huh. Elvin. Elvin was a great man, a great musician, and he was very, very warm and very engaging. Mm-hmm. And man, I'll tell you one story. We were, we went we were in Japan, and um, Elvin had a club called International Elvin. Mm-hmm. So I think I think that was in Nagasaki. I think it was. I'm not exactly sure of the city. I can't really remember the city. Uh-huh. But we were tour- we were touring in Japan, and went and called Elvin and said, "Hey man, we we have, we have a day off, so we want to come and see you." So, um, so of course we, so we caught the train and, um, got to El, got to where Elvin was. And then he and he and his wife, Keiko, they greeted us at the train station uh-huh. and Elvin, gave, Elvin gave everybody this big bear hug and lifted it, lifted us off the <laughs> ground, man. Everybody. Wow. And they had, he had flowers for us. He, they presented us each musician with some flowers. He, um, he, he gave you this big bear hug, hugged you. We, he brought us down to the mayor's office. We sat down with the mayor of the town, and uh, they gave us like this little pin from from the town. I forgot exactly where it was, uh-huh. but then we went, that night we went to his club, and the septet. Uh, I didn't play, of course, because Elvin was Elvin was on the drums. I just sat and watched. Uh-huh. But the rest of the session had a jam session with Elvin at his club. Yeah, and so. Uh, and he was just so warm and engaging, man. We went to his house a few times, man, and drank hot sake when he pulled out. Say, yeah, I have some sake here, guys. I want some sake. Say, but how do you want it? You want it warm or you want it cold? What you want? <laughs> yeah. So Elvin was Elvin was a great man, and, and so uh, you know, and you know, and so some a lot of the musicians that we ran into, that we came across was very very warm and had that kind of vibe. Billy Higgins was the same way. Uh-huh. Billy Higgins was a good guy, man. He was just like you saw. If you ever saw Billy Higgins play, anybody who saw Billy Higgins play, you saw the smile on his face and um, the joy that he had in the music, and that was very, very genuine. Uh-huh. You know, so it was a lot of musicians that we got that we came in contact with who were very, very engaging and very warm. Yeah, and um, you know, some would you know kind of stand off and stay in the way, uh-huh. but most of the guys. Most of the guys were warm. Yeah, oh, that's that's really that's really cool. To um, it sounds and were they were these you know was it was Elvin Jones and Billy Higgins um, were they big influences before you started to get to know them or, or be around them? No, they were, they were definitely a big influence before. Um, of course, Elvin playing with with John Coltrane. Mm-hmm. I I was very very familiar with his playing. Uh-huh. I tell you another. Story. I was um. Uh, in 1981, I did a show called One More Time, mm-hmm. and this was a 19, 1920s based musical that was in London. Okay. So I was in London. For, I was in London. I stayed in London for six weeks. I mean, six months playing in the West End, the West End Theater District. Uh-huh. So after my gigs, 
um, every night. I would go to a club called Ronnie Scott's. Yeah, I've been there. I know the club. Okay, so Ronnie Scott's, during that time, I mean, they were bringing everybody, everybody, all the, all the jazz musicians were playing, was playing Ronnie Scott's, either before the European tour or at, at the end of their European tour. Mm-hmm. Everybody was playing Ronnie Scott's. So I got to go to Ronnie Scott's <coughs> almost every night after uh-huh. my gigs. And I heard so many different people. I heard... Panama Francis and the Savoy Sultan. I heard, heard Elvin. I heard, um, I heard Tony. I mean, I heard Art Blakey. Uh huh. I heard, um, I heard, I heard uh, Sarah Vaughn was playing in it. Wow. So I heard a lot of, I heard a lot of musicians at um, Ronnie Scott's. So it just so happened that I go up to hear hear Elvin. Elvin, Elvin was playing there that particular night, that particular week. Uh-huh. So I I had been at the club and just just sitting in the audience and just checking him out. So at the end of the night, this is when I first met him before I before I had associated him with Winston. Uh-huh. When I first met him, so I, I said, I said, Mr. Jones, I said, I really, really enjoy your playing. I said, you've been a big influence on my life, you know, on my playing. And, and I, I hear you doing this lick that you're playing this on the drums, man. I said, uh, and I've been sitting there watching you every night, and I just can't figure out what you're doing. Hmm. And he's like, <laughs> he's laughing, <laughs> and he said, he said. Tell me, boy. Let me show you how you do that. <laughs> so, man, he, he he took me to the stage and set me behind the drums, and he he, he played this. Well, actually, he, he got on the drums first, uh-huh. and he did he did the lick that he was that I was trying to learn how to play. He did it very for me, real real slow. Uh-huh. He showed me exactly what he was doing, and showed me how to how to use it. Hmm. And so, man, so that was just that was the very first time I got to meet him. You know, this is this is apart from Winton and all that other stuff. Yeah, he would that was. It was just my engagement with him alone. And he was really, and, uh, obviously, it sounds like really giving. Yes, he was. He really was, man. Yeah. And so and, uh, um, where where can we find that lick? Where can we hear that lick? Uh, what song? Or what? Oh, man, I, I, don't, I don't have it. In, I, don't, I, I haven't recorded it. Okay. Uh, it's a song, but uh, uh, it's, it's a three-stroke roll. Okay. Check out and do. Check out and do. Check out and do, check out and do. It's like that. That's how, that's how it sounds. Okay. So I just have to, you know, one day when I do this, when I do this, this next podcast with you or something, and we have some visual, I can play it for you. Okay. Yeah, but, that'd, that'd be awesome. Uh, so yeah. oh, that that sounds amazing to have, you know, someone that you've looked up to for so long, and then to have them, you know, be so giving, and um, which which I feel like you're you are doing right now by by talking with me. Um, so. What what exactly when did education be a part of become a part of what you do and 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 I'd like to find out more about Crew Day Riley and what and what you do um, working with kids in in uh, in New Orleans. Well, education for me, uh, as I as I said earlier in the beginning of our conversation, I never had any training on the drums. Mm-hmm. So, um, and being associated with Winton. You know, he said he said to the septet, he said, "Man, listen, we have to go into the into to these cities and have more of an impact on on the musicians than than just going in and playing a gig." So we were like, "Well, what do you what are you planning to do?" <laughs> hey, man, so well, we have to go in, into these cities and have workshops. Mm-hmm. We have to do instead of just going and play a gig, we have to come in a day early or so and um, and have workshops and and teach these kids how to play. And so, uh, so one of the things. So I said, "Well, Winston, I can't teach any kids. I don't know how to teach kids, man. I never played. You know, I never I had. I never had lessons. Mm-hmm. I don't know how to teach. I don't really know how to teach." And he says to me, "Well, you play the drums, don't you?" Hmm. I said, "Sure, I play the drums." He said, "Well, just figure out what you're doing and tell it to him." Hmm. So. So it put something on my mind, and it made me really, really have to really think about exactly what I was playing, and so, and so, in order to verbalize it and put it into words, and that people could understand. Uh-huh. So it made me really, really um, focus on exactly what I was playing and how, how you know, how I was creating whatever sounds I was creating, so that I could, so, so that I could actually start telling, start t- t- uh, telling other younger drummers. And it my teaching um, experience evolved from that. Uh-huh. So, um, so 
and my teaching style is still the same. It's just that I teach from a, from a, a practical perspective as opposed as opposed to a, 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 a methodical uh, uh, something from from a method book. Yeah, I'm, I'm I'm really about the practicality of playing the drums, and um, you know, and so when I when I teach, I always give people lessons based on their ability and my experiences. Yeah. And uh and so and so what what is Crew de Riley? Well Crew de Riley is something my kids my children made up. Uh-huh. And um it's it was just the um well put it to you like this. My I, I have a I have I have a fairly large family. Uh huh. You know I'm I'm a, I'm a grandfather of of, of uh, eleven grandchildren. Oh, okay. I have, I have 11 grandchildren. I have five children. Uh-huh. And we would all, oftentimes, we would go on cruises on these, to take these cruises out of New Orleans or out of, out of Miami or whatever. We would go on these Caribbean cruises. Mm-hmm. And it just so happened that we could get a, we could get a, um, a discounted ticket, a discounted cruise ticket. If we were, if we were incorporated as a, as a, um, as a youth group or something like that. Oh, okay. So my, my, my children kind of put that thing, put Crew D. Riley together. Uh-huh. They, my oldest children put that together, Crew D. Riley. So, and we made T-shirts of it, and we, you know, and when we cruise, that's how, I don't know why, how you got that name, though, because that was just, that wasn't, you know, it wasn't for um for a school or anything. It was just something that we put together. Yeah, to, um, I just came across it somewhere. I, yeah, I'm not sure where. Uh, that's that's yeah. awesome. So 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 you have a you have a family band. Yeah, man, I've been married to my wife for 45 years. Uh huh. 45 years. And, uh, 45 years. Wow! Four, Congratulations. Four or five. So and we have we have five children, and we have 11 grandchildren, and they're all doing well. Um, they're all well. And uh, that's great. And uh, I've been very, very blessed that I've never had another job. Uh-huh. I, I was able to support my whole family and educate my children. They've, you know, I have to to play music. Yeah. One of my daughters is a, one of my daughters is a teacher. One of my daughters is a nurse. My son is a correctional officer. I have another daughter who's a nurse in school. Mm-hmm. Um, I have my two, three, three, three of my grandchildren are in college. Okay. One wants to be a doctor, wants to be a pharmacist, and one is a, a writer at Howard. Uh, yeah. Our university. Yeah. So, so oh, I feel very, very blessed that I have a family, and not only just to having a family, but having a family and having a musical career, um, where I'm respected as a musician, and and having a family life, that's um, it's been a great, great, a super blessing for me. Yeah. In that regard. Yeah, and that's and that's not always easy to balance to balance being a musician and having a family. It's that's really great to hear, but you know. That is so- so true. Uh, and, well, you know. Sorry, go ahead. I I just want to say the the, the 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 really the mortar that kept this all these bricks together was my wife. Uh huh. You know, we met we met when we were thirteen years old, and we um we maintained a friendship, and then we got married. When we were eighteen. Oh wow. And 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 after marrying, we you know we stayed together, and um and she didn't bother. You know, I played music, and so I was able to one thing led to another in my musical career where. Sometimes you know I couldn't pay the rent. I couldn't couldn't. I didn't have enough money to pay the rent. But other times I was able to buy a house. Uh huh. So, so it was feast. Sometimes, sometimes it was famine. Yeah. But over the years, over the years, you know, the feast started coming in more than you know we had. Than we experienced famine. That's so, great. but my wife, my wife was was the was the, the person that kept kept us all together as a family. Wow, oh, that's that's so cool to hear. Um, that that well. Thank you so much for talking to me. I just want to ask you, so how, how, what, you know, I know touring is a huge part of what you do. What are, what are you doing, you know, now that you, right now with the, with COVID and not touring, not being a big thing? Well, I, I'm doing, I've done a couple of recording sessions. Uh, when I hang up from you to do a, a live stream with Delphio Marcellus with a big band. Oh, nice. And can people tune and, uh, into that? Yeah, I, I'm not exactly sure how to, but I, I can give you. Well, maybe if people look up um, Delphio Marsalis, maybe they'll be able to find it. Yeah, and, and it's something that we're doing for Penn State. Okay. It's something for Penn State, and uh, we'll be doing that, you know, shortly. It's, it's actually it's for seven o'clock, which is in thirty minutes. 
Okay. And about the, you know, the, so we'll be doing out out. So I'm in, uh, I'm doing little projects like that. Uh huh. Um, and I you know I just I did did something with Terrence Blanchard last week. We did a, um, a show at his house. Mm-hmm. Um, so, Is that also a, like a live stream? Uh, yeah, it was a live stream at Terrence Blanchard's house. Uh huh. So so I, I I have little small projects, but no gigs, no gigs. They uh-huh. they aren't in the gig. You know, and um, so. You know, we're just trying to. I'm just trying to stay afloat like everybody else, man. You know, this this pandemic is is um is is really really throwing the whole world for a loop. Yeah. And it's put the put the world on hold, man. We're all on hold, man. Trying to trying to navigate through this thing. Yeah. So. Well, uh, and I want to let people know that that um you know you have you have music that people can buy. Um, you have an album that is it. When did you release Perpetual Opt- Optimism? I, that professional was released in um, in nineteen. Let's see, two thousand nineteen, I think it was. Okay, so re- then, recently. Yeah, and in two thousand seventeen, um, I released uh, new a new record called New Direction. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Perpetual Optimism actually got to number one on the jazz charts, and it stayed there for like five weeks, or, you know, something like that. Nice. So and, new, um, new Direction is your most recent. No, perpetual optimism. That is okay. Okay, got it. Got it. Yeah, and yeah. Um, I was just listening to it, and that's what I was playing before we started talking, and was really enjoying that. Um, and uh, there's there's a ton of other things we could talk about because I was curious about um, playing with percussionists and playing with um, Pedrito Martinez and um, all that stuff. But but I know you have you have um, this live stream that you're doing. Um, so I hope people can tune into the live stream. And um, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk with me. And um, I really, you know, as someone who's admired your playing for many years, you know, it's, it's really nice to, to be able to, to, you know, communicate verbally and hear about what you're, you know, what, what was going on with different things that you're up to. Um, and also, I have an idea. I'll, 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 um, I'll, I'll text or call you. Um, and I was wondering, are you, are you teaching online at all or doing anything like that right now? No, not really. Uh, um, you know, I, no, I haven't been teaching online. Um, uh, as I said, man, you know, music is, is such a spiritual thing for me. I like being close with people and, yeah. and you know, and I, it's hard. I, I can't, I really can't get to the vibe, to, to vibrate, to, to vibration with, with, with cats through the, through the video screen. Yeah, yeah. You know, a conversation is one thing, but playing music is, is another thing. I like to see, see people's hands and see, you know, exactly what's going on. Like, it really, it really hear, yeah. hear what's going on, you know. So um, I haven't really I haven't really done any, any live stream teaching. Yeah. So. Uh, also, so, uh, are, are you going to do any others? I, I caught a few live streams where you played with uh, with your other group, and I know you also have the the um, the group with Jason Marsalis and Shannon Powell. Um, are you going to be doing some more of those? Yeah, I hope to be doing some more of those those gigs as well. Um, we have we have been for um, Thanksgiving night. And okay. There were restrictions where you can have a lot of people, so I think that's that's going to be our first gig if all goes well. But you know, it seems like this pandemic is is taking is you know this the second wave that's coming in is you know is is exp- is digitally. Yeah, definitely. And so I don't know, I don't know if we're going to still be able to do it by next week. So we'll see, man. We'll see. Okay. Well, I wish I wish the best to you and. uh and once again, it's really appreciate you taking the time to talk with me. Uh, and, you know, I hope people will tune in and check out what you're doing and support what you're doing. I'm sure they but will. I really thanks for reaching out, Cliff. And uh, hopefully we'll do it again, man. Yeah, I hope thank so. You. And all the best to everyone who's, who's checking it out. And thank you all for checking it out. And uh, hope, hopefully, you know, it was informative and you got something out of it that, that can help you. Yeah, well, I know I did, and I, 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 I think other people probably did as well. Well, have a good evening and good weekend. Take care, brother. All right. Peace. Peace. Bye.